Hello again, Guyana, and welcome to The Public Interest. I am Malaika Ramsey. Thank you very much for joining us this week. As always with us is the President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, His Excellency, Brigadier David Granger. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much, Malaika. And welcome to our journalists this week, Ms. Rad Motilal from the National Communications Network, NCN, and Mr. Adam Harris. Most of you know him as our veteran journalist from the Kaichur News, and he's also from Prime News. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Great to have you. This week's program is designed to initially focus on the issue of tackling domestic violence. I mean, even though there's not been a recent upsurge, so to speak, in domestic violence, we can't wait until there's an upsurge to deal with these issues. Your Excellency, have you encountered evidence that may suggest that the reason we continue to see incidents of domestic violence is because perpetrators don't necessarily have a fear anymore when it comes to law and order as it relates to the police. Because the fact is, the police officers always say, well, we don't get involved in family matters. What is your uh, take on this issue? Well, there has been a lot of uninformed comment. and I've heard that it's anecdotal evidence that we don't have any concrete data um, about that. But I, I have heard, and uh, as a result of that, the police have strengthened their um, domestic violence unit, um, the DVU. I don't know to what extent it actually functions within stations, within uh, police divisions, but there is a, a practice of teaching uh, domestic violence on the training courses at the uh, Felix Austin Police College. And um, there should be greater enforcement, but before we come off this topic, there is a cultural problem that most members of the police force, perhaps as much as uh, maybe 85% of the police force, are made up of males. And they carry with them certain cultural attitudes. And one of those attitudes, it, it occurs in other countries of the world, is that um, people don't like to get involved in man-wife story. This is domestic. Uh, once they see the word domestic, they uh, separated from other crimes. You know, if you, if, a, if, you, if you go and cuff a policeman down Water Street, you will be charged. But if a policeman goes home and cuffs his wife, he probably won't be charged. It's a cultural problem which has to be overcome. We can't be satisfied with that in 2016 in the modern Guyana. Okay, all right. Thank you, sir. Um, sir, if Adam. I may. Mm -hmm. um, for the greater part, we see domestic violence as husband <coughs> against wife but they extend it also to children. So when a parent beats a child, that is considered domestic violence. However, some feel that the law is too rigid when it comes to parents flogging their children. Uh, your views on this, sir? I think that in 2016, um, the better course of action would be for parents to avoid uh, corporal or physical punishment of children. Uh, there was a time when it was typical and people felt, you know, a spirit of rod to spoil the child. And uh, I think that is ancient, that is backward. Um, a, a caring parent should uh, use non-force, non-physical um, means to deal with, with discipline within the home. And that child would learn to handle conflict. That child would learn to uh, reconcile with other children when he or she goes to school or he or she come, you know, gets married, you know. But if people feel that the, the way to deal with indiscipline or misconduct is flogging, that child will continue the cycle of violence. And when he or she becomes a parent, will use the same methods. And what we see happening in Guyana today is that many adults that are reported in the newspaper um, can only deal with controversy or conflict um, by physical violence. You know, you in a minibus and somebody opens the window and rain comes in, and there's only one way to deal with that. You go to a wedding house and um, you know somebody you know, dances with your wife. Well, the person will probably you know die. So we need to remove all forms of corporal or physical punishment in school or in the home. So um, maybe 50 years ago, 100 years ago, it might have been typical. But the days of going into the classroom and seeing that wild cane hanging up there, the days of going home and seeing the wild cane, I think are past. And uh, intelligent, educated parents must use different means, which don't involve the use of the application of physical force. Mm -hmm. um, 
Your Excellency, I want to ask, uh, you spoke about the cultural um, change that is necessary, and I think one of the uh, main factors is the mindset of victims. There is a problem when dealing with domestic violence that people back out at the last moment, so there is no real penalty instituted and no deterrent to others. Uh, what do you think can be done to change the mindset of victims so that this issue can be dealt with in such a way that it it, it prevents others from doing it when they see what? Well, the basic line that I have taken personally and within my partnership, the APNU, and within the coalition is to deal with these issues on the basis of inequality. Once the relationships are unequal, you are going to get domination and victimization. But the solution that I would advocate at a personal level is to treat women as equal. So, um, you know, once you have that mindset, as you call it, you know, you would you use different means of resolving conflict. But if you regard a person as um, inferior, uh, either, you know, within the home, husband, wife, within the school, teacher, student, or within the country, you know, employer, employee, once there is this inequality, um, you will have a resort to forceful measures of imposing your will. In a husband-wife relationship, um, this is the best place to solve the question of inequality. In the wider society, we look at things like making sure everybody gets uh, a similar education. If, you've got a, if you're a UG student, you've got a bachelor's degree in law, and your wife is a UG student who has a bachelor's degree in law, the chances of, um, of uh, maybe physical violence might be less. But if your wife is dependent on you, you know, if she was a former, maybe a menial worker, you know, a manual worker, um, getting, say, the minimum wage, $57,000, and you might be a successful attorney, can own $570,000, you know, um, you create a dependency. She knows that if she complains or goes away, you know, she'll be out of half a million dollars a month. So she stays and takes the blows. So my idea is, my approach is not one of, um, of um, uh, mindset. It's one, it's one of inequality. And my approach would be to remove inequality. Uh, when you have two adults with similar education, similar income, people will respect one another. If, if they don't, uh, if they're unequal, they start to disrespect each other. Okay, yes, Adam, you're uh, free to continue. Sir, there is also, I suppose, uh, we live in a male chauvinist world. But Do you? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sir, but women are also abusers. There are many, many cases of women abusing their husbands who are either ashamed to report or when they go to the police station to report, the police are laugh at them and send them away. Um, can there be a solution to this aspect of domestic violence? Well, again, it's the relationship, as I mentioned just now. It might be an unequal relationship. Sometimes um, the male, I don't know. I mean, we just, uh, we're just discussing this in a general way. The male may be um, ill or dependent on the wife for some reason or the other. You know, she might have inherited the property from, from her dad or her uncle, and he really is the, um, the tenant, she's the landlady. So my approach generally is that once there is this gross inequality, there is likely to be domination. And um, the woman could very well put, her, put the man out of the house, you know, beat him, you know. I've heard of cases like this, right? And um, I, as I said, you know, without further evidence, I would feel that once the relationship is unequal, or asymmetrical, um, you're likely to have domination. And um, uh, if the person involved has never had the opportunity to resolve conflict in a, in a peaceful manner, you could beat him and throw him out, you know, take away his clothes. <laughs> but in a quick follow-up, sir. But what can we do to get the policemen involved? I mean, this is something at that the government has some control of, get policemen to take these reports seriously? It is partly a cultural problem, but it, for the police it's a training problem, and it has to be done within the training school. And you have to have supervisory systems within the police force um, to check 
that um, maybe the inspector or the superintendent would see what these reports are, what action has been taken. Um, and if there's no follow-up at that station, maybe uh, at the next level, could be the, at the organization level, you establish uh, d domestic violence units and um, you recruit more female staff. Right now, the police force probably has about 15% women. I may be wrong, but it, I get that impression. And um, in some cases where there is a high incidence of domestic violence, it may be necessary to have more female police. Uh, notoriously, there are very few police women in the hinterland because many of them tend to be mothers and run households. And that's where trafficking takes place. If perhaps victims of trafficking could uh, expect that they would receive counsel from a female, a sympathetic female officer, perhaps we, we you know, deal with the problem better, similarly in, in, in um, non-urban non areas. But we need to recruit more police women. We need organizational change in terms of um, uh, creating these domestic violence units. And we need training, better training in the um, police force so that there's no excuse for a subordinate who does not investigate these crimes thoroughly and uh, seek solutions. But uh, coming back to the question you raised, if a woman does complain, um, she would perhaps be more willing to speak to a female sergeant who sits down with her. Um, some male might just say, oh, why don't get him a half break <laughs> you know, and dismiss it. So I'm not saying this happens all the time. But I believe that there should be more women police officers who deal with these matters, and there should be DVUs in all of the um, major stations. On that note, just a quick follow-up. Uh, or can we see maybe a move to strengthen counseling and maybe uh, support counseling groups and units like Help and Shelter that offer support to these women countrywide? My take is that we need to have a very careful examination of the problem. There's been a lot of reporting, but not much researching. Uh, people report what has happened, oh, X was killed, Y was raped, Z was, um, you know, brutalized. But um, these reports do not go to the heart of the problem. We're looking for causation. Why is this behavior prevalent? And you can take it to other crimes, for example, suicide. Why? Are there so many suicides? Why is there so much interpersonal violence? You know, at wedding houses, these are sometimes friends. Mm -hmm. And when they get sober, they regret what has happened. So what I'm looking at is perhaps more research to find out what are the causes um, of this violent behavior. And we don't see much of that. You see a lot of report, you know, uh, you know, 29 women killed this year, so far, and that type of thing. But at the end of it, you, you may even have um, little snippets from each victim, but you'd never really get the cause at a country at the, at the national scale. Why is domestic violence so prevalent? Why is suicide so prevalent? Why are certain types of interpersonal crimes so prevalent? We're not getting that. A lot of reporting, yes, I praise the reporters, but not enough research is being done. Okay, thank you, sir. We're now free to move on to the other segment where you can pose other questions. This, this is, is the other segment. This is, I thought it was. Anyway. So we can begin with you, Rada. Okay, I will have to come with the topical issue of Gaisuku and the imminent closure of Wales Estate. Um, there is a view that he, the government is deviating from what was recommended in the COI report. Uh, would you care to respond? Commission inquiry is not gospel, um, and we have uh, practical measures to, to consider. And in the case of Wales, it was, it was very practical. It's not the first estate ever to have been closed, and it is um, a major loss making um, estate, uh, mainly because the factory itself um, requires. Uh, an enormous amount of money to rehabilitate or, or repair it. There was a tendency even under the PPP for sugar to migrate from west to east. And this perhaps is a continuation of that trend. As you know, the major um, or the PPP flagship project is, is easternmost part of Guyana. So um, many, many years ago, sugar cultivation migrated from Estigrebo to Demerara. And it's moving from Demerara towards Borbis. Uh, for all sorts of reasons, practical and climatic and other reasons. 
But bills is, is not sustainable. And um, it, you know, it is regretted that it had to be closed, but arrangements are being put in place over the next 11 months to ensure that the workers don't get hurt, that they could be reemployed, and maybe it's an opportunity for uh, a wider application of the principle of peasant cane farming. So it's not that if the sugar industry is in jeopardy, but uh, I personally believe that um, uh, peasant cane farmers could take up the slack. And that has been tried already in, in some parts of uh, West Demerara. Okay. And I would like to direct your attention to what seems to be a flagship project, the beautification of Georgetown. A lot of work is going into Merriman Mall and Durban Park. Whose idea it was to do those things and why? Well, Merriman's Mall, I presume, is part of the municipality. I don't think that was a result of any central direction. Um, so, I mean, I think people appreciate it. I myself believe there should be more open spaces. Uh, the open spaces that were enjoyed years ago, um, what used to be called Parade Drum, the Promenade Gardens, um, the National Park, the Botanical Gardens, have all fallen into decay. And uh, children need somewhere to go in the afternoons to play football or to simply relax, picnic. And uh, we're running out of those spaces. So I welcome the changes at, at the Merriman's Mall. And I believe it's driven by the city council itself. As far as the Durban Park is concerned, this is directly linked to the uh, 50th anniversary celebrations. And um, we were looking for an area where citizens of Georgia could uh, assemble. Uh, from time to time in other, uh, other uh, functions, as you know, on the 26th of May 2015, when we had the inauguration, uh, many people were surprised that the, uh, the national stadium, the new national stadium, uh, could not take off the amount of people who wanted to see that ceremony. Uh, there's a stadium of sorts, if you want to call it that, at Leonora, and that cannot accommodate the, 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 the amount of people who would want to attend these um, uh, events. And the decision was taken, uh, central level, and I, I would say the Ministry of the Presidency is responsible for that as a venue for um, the parades uh, starting the 23rd of February, which will be a small event. It will migrate from the public buildings uh, uh, compound. And that will be used for a play field for uh, many citizens of South and Central Georgetown. As you know, the population of Georgetown used to be mostly north and western. It is now southern and, and eastern. And uh, after the parades, it will be used as a public place, kite flying, picnicking, and, and just hanging out. So we are opening more public places because green spaces and uh, sport and entertainment are important aspects of human development. And some people were forced to go to the sea walls. I think after the overtopping, they had to leave there. But that used to be a major hangout area. As long as they're well lit, they're safe, parents would feel comfortable knowing that their children are playing at the mall. Uh, it's clean entertainment and green entertainment at the same time. Um, I want to pick up on um, the point raised with the 50th anniversary celebration. There is a view, particularly in the media, of course, which we're closer with, um, that uh, it's a bit slow. Are you satisfied with the, the level of, of planning and act, events rolling off? Because at least we were expecting maybe an, a sporadic event throughout the year. It's, it's a major milestone. It could be quicker, it could be quicker, um, and uh, there could be better information, um, better flow of information. Work is going on. I am satisfied that work is being done. Um, speed work is being done, but the public does not know enough at this point in time. Mm. There's a countdown in the papers. Right now it should be about 130 days. So, and uh, people, are, people want to plan their events. Member, people in the diaspora are coming home. Um, People want to plan their holidays. Uh, more information has to be provided to enable the residents both here and in the diaspora to, to plan. 
It's an important event. Um, from my point of view, it is a time of coming together, a time of healing. But if we are to uh, achieve the maximum impact, um, people must be better prepared. Um, they must know what's going on. They must want to prepare. And preparation is only not at central government level. Preparation must be in the NGOs, in the churches, in the communities. Um, back in, uh, in 1966, uh, Adam, he's an old man. He could remember that very well. They, there were many, you know, some communities would build independence arches and they would have independence programs. I agree with you, I'm not seeing that activity as yet, but if they knew more and they were encouraged or energized, um, there would be big, better participation. Maybe the sense of patriotism is a bit low, it needs <laughs> to come up. No, I don't. It, it is there and uh, if you engage with the diaspora, if you spoke with people, you would discover that over the last eight months, people are very pleased with some of the changes taking place, some of the physical changes taking place, and they're proud of their city. Um, where are you from? I'm from Georgetown. You know, a, a few months or years ago, people said, that place? But now they say, yes, this place. I'm proud of Georgetown. And I expect that closer, uh, the closer we get to the 26th of May, the more you'll see um, the flags will be coming out. People will be wearing their buttons and um, showing pride in, in, in being Guyanese again. So one of the things that actually kept people away was crime. On the campaign trail, you said we are going to put a lid on crime. As I move about Georgetown and Lower East Coast, there seems to be a lid on crime, but the crime has moved more or less eastward. Is there anything we can do to further cap the, the crime situation in the country? We are doing quite a lot, um, frankly, um, and I think you discover that more serious crimes are solved more quickly um, than before. We haven't been able to prevent the occurrence of crime, but we have been able to detect crime. Um, sometimes a gang would you know, burn down a house or kill someone, and within days that person is arrested. Now where does crime come from? Where does violence come from? It didn't drop out of the sky. We have inherited a practice which became I would say almost insidious over the last, uh, um, since the start of this new millennium, in which life was very cheap. Uh, people were gunned down, people were killed, and uh, many of the murderers, you know, could be sure that there would be no inquiry, no investigation, even mass murders. I think the newspaper that you work with, um, you know, some of your employees were victims of a massacre at Eccles, and there's been no commissioner inquiry. Bartica, I keep pointing to you, why is that? You know? Because I'm from Bartica, too. You're from Bartica. <laughs> well, there you get, you had a massacre. There's a big monument there, but, but no inquiry. So, unfortunately, in 2016, we have, have inherited um, a criminal practice of gun running, of execution murders, of interpersonal violence. And you can't wipe those away, you know, with, with the, you know, with the, you know, with the magic wand. You know, we are still seeing a lot of those crimes. What I call the secondary impact. Many of the young people who witnessed those crimes, and remember during the troubles, people used to speak of the Taliban. People used to speak of these youngsters. Well, they've grown up now. <laughs> they've grown up now, and many of them have only learned um, one way to survive. And Sometimes people admit that they, they kill for money. Um, we even had a case um, in the East Bank where we had a higher purchase killing. Yeah. <laughs> a, man got, a man carried out an execution, he didn't even get paid for it. Um, so violence has become perhaps uh, uh, not endemic, but it, it's difficult to eradicate, and we are working on it because many of our young persons who uh, grew up in that period of the troubles um, still practice um, what they learned. Yes, we are doing something about it. I did have um, an encounter with uh, Prime Minister David Cameron of the United Kingdom when I was at United Nations in um, September. And um, I asked him to restore the Security Sector Reform Action Plan I met him again at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Malta, 
I met the British High Commission. As you know, um, there were between 12 and 15 plans given to the previous administration, which uh, they did not implement. And I will implement them, but it will take a bit of time to turn um, the tide on criminal activities. But right now, I meet the commissioner every single week um, with the Minister of Public Security. Changes have taken place. The divisional commander for F Division is now living in Bartica, um, which is the capital of that whole western SEQ. Um, mounted police have been sent to uh, Rupununi, the biggest region in Guyana. Um, and uh, we are bringing about uh, changes, not only incremental changes, but also qualitative changes in the p p police performance. So we, we haven't gotten there yet, but I do believe that we have. Um, put in place some of the measures that will bring crime under control. Uh, the numbers are still high, but in fact, when you look at the numbers, the, the, I think the, the amount of murders for 2014 is slightly lower than, um, sorry, 2015. 2015, slightly lower than 2014. Not much, but um, there will be some more execution, but I expect that by having the commander of the division based at Bartica, he's close to an airstrip, he's close to a stelling, and he's got ATVs. I expect that he'll be doing more work in the hinterland and some of those lawless crimes that you had in the mining areas are going to be brought under control too. So I think we have to be a little patient. Things will get better. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, please choose your final questions mm -hmm. wisely. Um, I'm going <laughs> to go with the one that was making headlines recently. There, there are some questions raised uh, which sort of challenged whether the coalition is standing on form ground. Are there any cracks that these uh, questions can seep in to shake the coalition? No, I do not see any cracks. I mean, we are six parties, and uh, we have abided largely by the um, accord, which brought us into existence on the 14th of February, 2015. Um, the prime minister is now fully part of the presidency. He, his duties are clear. Um, he chairs the, most of the cabinet. When he's not there, he was not there on the day before yesterday. It was chaired by um, Minister Ramjatan. So who chairs the cabinet is not uh, really important because the decisions are taken collectively. Um, once Minister Ali Kok chaired it, once Minister Ramjatan chaired it, once Mr. Greenwich chaired it. So the things that people um, would like to assert in the public domain are not necessarily true. Uh, the coalition is strong, and we're going into local government elections as a coalition. And um, I expect that uh, the Guyanese people as a whole are satisfied with the solidarity, the integrity, um, um, and the unity of the coalition. Quickly, Adam. I want to take you to the issue of the devil finding work for idle hands. Mm -hmm. Once young people are gainfully employed, it seems as though we could expect to see a drop in crime. I know that you've initiated programs, um, especially infrastructure development programs, that would create employment for these people. You talk about people's militia, you talk about national service. I see a rush by young people, sorry I'm so long, to join the army and join the police. Mm. Is there anything else we can see that could keep young people gainfully employed? Well, I've tried to, I've tried to um, convince them not to seek employment with the state because um, we are not aiming at having um, bigger armies or bigger militias or bigger police forces. We are aiming at self-employment and we are trying to get young people back into schools, back into training programs um, so they could start up small businesses. What we want to see is more agro-processing. What we want to see is microfinancing and the Minister of Business, Mr. Gaskin, and uh, also the Ministry of um, Finance will be looking at uh, the extension of micro-financing uh, schemes. I was very happy a few weeks ago in December, a few weeks ago in December, to uh, reopen the LEN. And I see LEN as being a model that could be used in BEN, in Bartica, you know, <laughs> and um, other communities where young people congregate, now that there is a downturn in the gold industry. I see that um, intelligent young people who are hardworking would be able to get some microfinance to help them in bottling and packaging and, and processing foods. So I see a lot more 
entrepreneurship. I see a lot more self-employment um, rather than um, looking for jobs in the state sector. Thank you, Your Excellency. President of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana, Brigadier David Granger. Thank you very much, Radha Mosi Lal from NCN and uh, Adam Harris from Prime News and Kaitro News. This has been another edition of The Public Interest. I am Malaika Ramsey. Join us again next time.